All right, good evening. Guten Abend. Thank you all for coming to the fifth and final installment of a roundtable series that's been being put on by UN and by FIU since last October. Our topic is Germany, the United States, and challenges of the 21st century. So this has been a series of roundtable discussions about issues that both the United States and Germany have in common. And we've covered topics including immigration, changing gender roles, climate change, trying to develop a competitive workforce. And tonight, our topic is political polarization and the rise of populism in both countries. Um, this is not an isolated event. It's part of a broader series of events being financed by the German Foreign Ministry. Um, called, uh, well, actually, it's not up here. The official name is the Deutschlandjahr, and the slogan you can see is Wunderbar Together. So it's a year that celebrates German-American friendship. Um, and the idea is to try to bring the countries closer together through a series of events. And there are Deutschlandjahr events being held in all 50 states um, for a whole year. So this is part of a, a um, series of a, over 1,000 events, I think. Um, it is being sponsored by the German Federal Foreign Office, but also by the Federation of German Industries. Um, and it's being implemented by the Goethe Institute. So we're very grateful um, to all of those entities for their support of this series that's been held both at UM um, and with Marcus Thiel over at FIU. Um, I'm also really thankful for a number of people who made the um, whole series work out. Um, not only Marcus for his help, especially with navigating bureaucratic kind of issues, um, but also to my assistant, uh, Francisco Perez, who's back in the back. He's an undergraduate student at UM who's been very helpful to me. Um, we're also really thankful to Fair to Remember Catering and Junior, who's been our um, nutrition source uh, for this series of events. Um, and also to students from the German International Parents Association, or GIPA, which is the program in the public schools. We have some GIPA volunteers out there greeting people on their way in. Um, and later on this evening, we'll have students from the Frost School of Music perform, and we're also really thankful to them for their help. Um, so this has been a, definitely a group effort, and I think it's been a great series. There's some people here, I think, who've been to all or most of these events, and I thank you um, for your participation. So what we'd like to do tonight is to talk about political developments in the two countries, and we have a great lineup of panelists from all across the globe actually here with us this evening. So my name is Louise davidson Schmich. I'm a professor of political science here at the University of Miami, and I'm going to start things off by giving you some background about political developments in Germany and the US um, over time and in recent years. Um, and then we're going to start looking to try to explain why we've seen these events and why we've seen the political changes that we have. Um, and the first person to help us make sense of that is Dr. Jonathan Weiler, who comes to us from UNC Chapel Hill. Jonathan is the author of the book Prius or Pickup, um, which talks about polarizing political attitudes both here in the United States and also um, in Europe. And he has copies of the book for sale if you'd like a sign copy. You can talk to him afterwards. Um, he will be followed by my colleague in political science at the University of Miami, Dr. Joe Yusinski. Joe is the author of Conspiracy Theories and People Who Believe Them. Um, and I don't believe you actually have copies of the book here, but we should have thought of those. But you can definitely get Joe's book online. And he'll be talking about conspiratorial thinking, um, both here uh, and in Germany. Then we have um, the next speaker is Dr. Marcus Thiel from FIU. Um, although I have to say that Marcus is also a UM alumni, so we're going to count him as a UM person too. Um, and he's going to be talking about political polarization in the European Parliament, so what's going on at the European Union level. Um, and our final speaker comes to us from Germany. This is Dr. Roger Stocker, who is from the University of Magdeburg. And he's an expert on German politics. And he's going to be speaking about some um, causes of the developments that we've seen in German politics so far. So to get the ball rolling, I just thought I'd give you a brief overview of um, both US-German relations and um, German and American politics since the end of World War II. So this is clearly going to be an extremely brief overview. But I want to hit a couple of important um, points. Where I want to start off from is to say that we've seen between the end of World War II and um, 
very recently in this country, um, real uh, stability in U.S.-German relations and strong and positive relationships between the U.S. and Germany. Um, after World War II, the uh, United States realized that if we wanted to have uh, peace and prosperity and security in Western Europe, destroying Germany was not the way to go about it. Um, instead, we had the Marshall Plan, and the U.S. spent a lot of money to help um, Germany reconstruct after the war. We established NATO to have security cooperation. We established positive um, trade and economic ties, and we were supportive in Germany's um, cooperation with other states in Western Europe to found the European Union. Um, and the stable consensus and these positive international relations continued up throughout the Cold War period. Um, I have a picture here of Helmut Kohl and George Bush, who were kind of the last leaders of their generation, but they were people who remembered World War II and sought to um, avoid those type of conflicts um, by having strong transatlantic cooperation. And there was a strong consensus on both sides that that was something um, positive. When we move into the Cold War period, we see a different generation of leaders. This is um, Bill Clinton and Gerhard Schroeder. They were younger. They didn't live through um, World War II or experience it in the same way. Um, but they also were po uh, committed to a positive and stable transatlantic relationship um, and shared the idea that there should be economic and security cooperation between the two countries and that they were um, part of their international role was to promote democracy and cooperation um, worldwide. While we had this period of stability and consensus in transatlantic relations, we can also see relative stability and consensus in domestic politics in the two countries as well. So if we look at the United States, um, since World War II, we've had a pretty uh, very stable two-party system, Republicans and Democrats. Um, there was, for a long time in the post-war period, um, a good bit of cross-party consensus in Congress um, in decision-making. And if we look at how political parties chose their presidential candidates, we can see that there was a lot of influence by party elites to try to pick um, moderate, candidates who could reach across the aisle and appeal to the broadest possible um, swath of the American public in order to win presidential elections. Um, and if we look across the Atlantic, we see similar patterns in Germany. Now, Germany has a different electoral system. The Bundestag, or Germany's equivalent to Congress, um, is elected through a system that's a lot more proportional. So it's possible in Germany for smaller parties to win um, seats in the legislature in a way that is very difficult to do in the United States. But despite that, we can see, um, this is a graph that shows uh, federal elections in Germany between 1957 and 2002, uh, that Germany had a, a party system that looked a lot like the United States. So these bars here show um, the share of the popular vote that was won by the Social Democratic Party, or the SPD, which is a left of center political party in Germany, and the CDU, the Christian Democratic Party, a right of center party. And you can see in this whole era, they won between like 75 and 90 percent of all votes. So again, in Germany, a pretty stable consensus surrounding two parties of the center left and the center right, who also oftentimes um, had a, a high degree of, of consensus on a number of different issues. So up until recently, that's what things have looked at look like. Things have started to change, which in one way works in our favor. I think one of the reasons why Germany decided to have this Deutschlandjahr and start to work on the German-American friendship is because they were concerned about some of the um, changes that had happened in this relationship. So in a sense, we're all beneficiaries of that. Um, but if we look at German-American relations in recent years, we can see that the two have become more strained. Um, so President Trump and Chancellor Merkel um, do not quite get along as well as some of their predecessors have. Um, President Trump has been very critical of Germany's um, trade relations with the United States and also with their contributions to NATO. Um, and as a result of some of these tensions, uh, Chancellor Merkel has also started to indicate that maybe um, she can't count on the transatlantic relationship and maybe Europeans have to do, have to work um, a little bit more to defend their own interests or take care of their own interests. So we start to see um, some tension in these relationships. And we also start to see some tension in domestic politics in both of the countries. So if we look at the United States, we used to have this pattern where parties would pick a really moderate kind of party insider to run for president who could reach across the aisle and attract a lot of votes. 
Um, if we look at the 2016 presidential election, we see that in the Democratic Party, things worked kind of like they were supposed to, according to political science theory, right? We had Bernie Sanders, who's hardly a loyal Democrat, right? He's actually serving as an independent um, and really critical of the party, um, being one of the top finishers in the primaries. But ultimately, Hillary Clinton, who had a more had deeper roots and a longer commitment to the party, was the presidential candidate. Things on the Republican side looked a lot different, right? There were a number of people who wanted to be the Republican presidential nominee, who had long-term party experience, who were governors, um, or who had served in Congress for a long time. Um, but the winner of that primary um, was Donald Trump, who was obviously an outsider um, to the party. This is a picture of him um, with his fellow party member, Mitch McConnell. You can see how well they're getting along in this picture. Um, and in many ways, he's quite critical of the Republican um, establishment and some traditional Republican positions. If we look at NAFTA, for example, for a long time, the Republican Party was one that embraced free trade and positive trade relationships. Trump's obviously been very critical um, of the NAFTA agreement. Um, Trump and his supporters are also very, very critical of politics as usual, right, and the established political elite. So this idea of draining the swamp implies that, you know, Washington and Washington insiders and the way that politics as usual have been run are corrupt and are problematic and we need to get rid of them. Um, he has very polarizing rhetoric toward his political opponents, right, questioning um, the validity or the legitimacy of other candidates. Um, and we can also see really critical rhetoric toward toward um, minorities and toward foreigners um, in the political discourse um, that Trump's been following. So uh, uh, not so much an appeal to be a moderate, middle of the road person who can reach across the aisle, but someone who's a lot more um, polarizing. And we can see on the other side of the aisle, we see similar developments um, within the Democratic Party. So if we look at the most recent uh, midterm elections, we see a lot of Democrats criticizing the established Democratic rank and file and trying to take positions um, that were um, not necessarily moderate or middle of the road positions, but ones that are um, a little bit more extreme, um, questioning the legitimacy of the elected officials um, from the other side of the aisle. So in the United States, what we have is growing tendency toward the extremes and right and left. But because we have a two-party system where really only one or two, or basically only two parties have a shot at winning elections, there's a lot of conflict within parties, right? Republicans fighting Republicans, Democrats fighting Democrats. If we look what's going on in Germany, we can see a lot of similarities in terms of the issues and concerns, but some differences in the way they manifest themselves politically. Oh, but before we do that, this is just, I think this is a nice graph that shows increasing um, polarization in the US Congress. So the blue dots represent um, Democrats in the US House. The red dots represent Republicans in the US House. And anything that's gray is um, a time when two representatives voted in the same way on an issue or a bill. So the more gray that we see, the more middle ground that we see, the more frequent votes were taken in Congress where Republicans and Democrats agreed with one another. So up at the top left is, or the top, this side, your, I guess that's your, that is your left, right? The top left is the 1950s, and we can see lots of gray, right? Lots of middle ground. Um, this is, it goes like you would read um, down here to 2011, the most recent figure where we can see that gray has almost disappeared, right? Democrats voting with Democrats, Republicans voting with Republicans, and not much middle ground when decisions are made. Um, if we look at Germany, we can see a lot of similar attitudes and arguments being articulated in Germany than we've seen um, with the Trump campaign. So in Germany in, um, in this century, a new political party has emerged on the scene, one that didn't exist before, um, and it's called the Alternative for Germany, or the AFD. And the AFD started off as a party that said, uh, that was very critical of the Euro and um, Merkel, the Merkel government's decision to bail out um, struggling Southern European economies. And they said there is an alternative for Germany and it's um, not, not, um, not being part of the Euro. 
That didn't get it elected. It didn't um, enter the Bundestag in 2013. So the AFD started articulating some more themes like we've seen in the United States. Um, so we can see up here at the top, corruption in government, a big theme that they stress these posters here saying Merkel has to go. Um, the Mer Merkel's party is not delivering on its promises. Um, we can see um, concerns about immigration, concerns about the rise of Islam, um, and concerns about immigration being a source of crime, which is something that we also see here um, in the United States. Um, just like in the United States, these kinds of calls and this kind of discourse did not go unanswered. Um, and so we see other parties providing other alternatives to what the AFD is offering. I think the clearest articulation of a counter position would be from the Green Party that's come out very vocally in favor of welcoming immigration um, and thinking about how Germany can become a multicultural society and providing a very different um, point of view. We can also see in Germany there's a small party, the Free Democrats, that have been around um, for a long time. But even here, they're calling for new thinking and some change to what's gone on before. Um, and then we also have a left-wing party in Germany, the left, which has really um, challenged some of the um, economic orthodoxy that's been going on, challenging um, NATO and military involvement, challenging um, trade agreements or um, economic cooperation that don't um, that maybe favor business more than labor. So all of a sudden, in addition to those centrist reach across the aisle, Christian democratic and social democratic perspectives, we're getting a whole other range of perspectives being articulated in Germany. And of course, some of these things are the same ideas, you know, Bernie Sanders kind of leftist economic ideas um, or very conservative kind of um, anti-immigrant sentiments in the Republican Party. But because of the German electoral system, rather than fighting among themselves within a party like we see the Republicans and the Democrats doing in the US, we see these taking the form and the shape of new parties. Um, so in 2017, German election results look like this. Those two parties, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats, that used to get 90% of the vote, barely got a majority. Together, they have 53% of the vote, and that's who the German government is now. Um, and we can see in the blue, the AFD getting above 10%, um, the liberals um, getting around 10%, and that left party and the green party together getting almost 20% together. So a real um, fragmentation, a range of different political views being articulated, um, and critical calls against things like um, transatlantic cooperation or European integration being heard that we didn't hear um, earlier in German or American political discourse. So where does this all come from? How can we understand that? We have a couple of different speakers here who are going to fill us in um, on why that is. So I'm going to turn the stage over now to Jonathan Weiler. Uh, thanks to you all for coming. Um, I want to uh, just make some very brief remarks up front about the sort of background to this book, Prius or Pickup, that uh, my friend and colleague Mark Hetherington and I published last fall. We wrote a book, an academic book, in 2009 called Authoritarianism and Polarization in American Politics. Um, if you want to write a best-selling book, make sure to include an eight-syllable word in the title of that book. So, um, and then, and that book was, um, whatever got the reception it got in academia for a few years. And then in 2016, um, because of the rise of Trump, it came to the attention of a broader audience, um, which led Houghton Mifflin to approach us to ask whether we had an interest in writing a book uh, for a broader audience that would introduce them to the ideas and themes that we talked about in the 2009 book. And I mention this in part to say that the terminology we used in the 2009 book, we changed for the new book. In 2009, we referred to two types of Americans. There are, of course, more than two types of Americans, but this was our sort of simplified version of what we thought was important for people to understand about why polarization had unfolded the way it has in this country over the last generation. In the first book, we talked about authoritarian-minded voters and non-authoritarian-minded voters. And in the new book, we changed those terms for various reasons that we could talk about during Q&A to fixed and fluid. And I'm going to say 
I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about who we mean by the fixed and fluid in this book and how we ascertain who is fixed and fluid um, as, I, as I go through this. Um, so um, the, I, I'm going to read you just very quickly here a passage from early in the book. Um, starting in the 2016 campaign, and this continues today, when Donald Trump has a rally, he frequently reads a poem. Um, he's done this many, many times now. And the poem he reads is called The Snake. Um, and it's based on an old Aesop's fable, The Scorpion. Uh, and I'm just going to read you briefly from how we describe this in the book. Um, Among the many images one might conjure of President Trump, performing at a poetry slam probably isn't one of them. And yet, a regular feature of his rallies during the 2016 campaign was to read a poem. Trump liked to tease the crowd before reading it, asking the throng whether they really wanted to hear it much like a professional wrestler might cup his ear with his hand to urge the crowd to yell louder. The poem is called The Snake, um, and the snake describes a tender-hearted woman who heeds the call of a snake in distress. She lovingly nurtures him back to health and exclaims how beautiful he is once revived. And how does he repay her extraordinary loving kindness? By fatally biting her. As she cries out in horror, asking how he could do such a thing, the snake chastises her. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grim, with a grin. You knew damned well I was a snake before you took me in. So Trump is communicating a very clear message to his audiences about the dangers and perils of inviting in strangers, that we cannot trust outsiders. We cannot trust people who look and sound differently than we do. And if we do, we invite peril and death and destruction. And his message is that clear and stark in his campaign rallies and in his rhetoric more broadly. So that is one poll of that is that that sort of mistrust, that skepticism, that antipathy toward outsiders is a worldview, we argue, that is well embodied in who in the folks that we call the fixed those who are wary and mistrustful of outsiders. There's many nuances and complexities in everything that I'm going to say here. But in terms of the broad brushstrokes that explain why we are divided the way we are, what we argue is that two very distinct psychological types now anchor the Democratic Party on the one hand and the Republican Party on the other hand. So anchoring the Republican Party is this fixed worldview that has this sort of skepticism and wariness of an increasingly diverse and changing society. And on the other side, and I'm just going to skip ahead here, on the other side, uh, we have folks who we describe as fluid. And we say that fluid folks are more open to uh, and more attracted to novelty and difference, uh, and more open to diversity. When you ask questions like, uh, do you like it when you hear people speak a different language, the fluid are likely to say, yes, we really like it. Uh, whereas the fixed, for example, are likely to say, no, we don't like hearing people speak a different language. And so these two different worldviews, as I said, we believe have come to anchor the two political parties. What's significant about that? We've had polarization before. This is not the first time in American history that we've been intensely divided. It's also not true that these worldview differences I'm describing only emerged five or 10 years ago. People have always had different instincts and ideas about difference and diversity. What's new about polarization now in the United States is the degree to which those psychological worldviews have aligned themselves so clearly with the two different political parties. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, so if you look at this data, uh, and I'm going to tell you in a minute how we determine who the fixed are and who the fluid are. But if you look at this data, you can see that in 1992, the Democratic Party is more or less evenly split between fluid folks on the one hand and fixed folks on the other hand. 
And likewise, in 1992, you can see that the Republican Party is almost evenly split between those who are fixed and those who are fluid. Fast forward to 2016, and the picture looks completely different, right? The Democratic Party is overwhelmingly populated by fluid voters, and the Republican Party is overwhelmingly populated by fixed voters. So what's happened over the last 25 years, and we'll probably save the why for Q&A, but what's happened over the last 25 years is that the fixed and fluid have clearly sorted themselves out into the Democratic and Republican parties. This is significant because in a previous era, political conflict was largely, not exclusively, defined by disagreement over economic issues, about which, at least in theory, one can imagine compromise. You think tax rates on the wealthy should be 50%, I think they should be 30%. There's an obvious middle ground there that we can at least theoretically get to. But the new political divide is not based on those kinds of economic policy issues primarily, it's based on cultural issues. It's based on these visceral gut level differences between fixed and fluid about which there really is no room for compromise. This is no longer sort of ideological conflict, it's not policy conflict, it's gut level, visceral. Folks who see the world differently than I do for the, from the perspective of the fluid, those who are fixed, and from the perspective of the fixed, those who are fluid, are not just wrong, they are a danger to America as I understand it. And those gut level instincts that now anchor the two political parties are at the core of political polarization. So I wanna show you a quick quote here. Um, so this is from a conservative blogger named Dan Para. And I swear I didn't make this up, he, he wrote this himself. He wrote a blog post about 10 years ago called Liberal Cars. And he ranked cars by the, the people who bought them. Um, and here's what he had to say about the Prius, which he ranked as the most paradigmatic, emblematic liberal car. And he says, we all know it's the car of choice of liberals everywhere. There is much a political statement as anything. By driving one of these cars, these folks are saying, I care, about, I care about everything more than you, and you hate the environment and support torture, right? So what's so interesting, I think, about that quote is that this is now sort of mixing together all of our political views with all of our non-political tastes and preferences. So we are, the things we buy, the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the food we eat, the kinds of communities we want to live in, are all reflective of the same instincts, the same worldview that also informs our political choices. So our political differences are no longer relegated exclusively or primarily to the political realm. They suffuse every choice we make and every part of our life. And it makes our differences, and this is not, you know, a lot of people say this, it makes our differences more gut level, visceral, and tribal than policy-based or narrowly political. And it's that quality and intense character of polarization that makes it so distinctive. So I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to, to Jeff. So we'll go from polarization to uh a much more extreme form of polarization. It's not just that I disagree with you, but I believe you're out to get all of us and that you're working in secret against the, the good American or German people. Um, thank you to Louise for inviting me um, and thank you for coming. So th this 10 minutes I have with you represents the last 10 years of research that I've done, mostly on the US, but we've been doing a few rounds of polling in Germany and other European countries too. Um, so a conspiracy, these are real, they happen all the time. So think when you have a small group of people acting in secret for their own benefit against the common good, and we use this term colloquially to mean something bigger than knocking over an ice cream truck or you know, a, a woman talking to her lover to knock off the husband to get the money and the inheritance. So something much bigger than that, something that goes after our bedrock ground rules. Um, and these are real because 
we have the evidence to show that they are real. So imagine Watergate. It's a real thing. We know it happened. People went to jail. They made admissions in open court. We have the records of this. Conspiracy theory, on the other hand, has all the same elements. It's a small group working in secret for their own benefit against the common good. And again, these go beyond simple criminal acts. Um, but they could be real. We don't know for sure if they're real or not. And they haven't been verified as real by the institutions that would study such a thing. Now, a conspiracy theory can explain a past, present, or future event or circumstance. So if we say, I think the CIA killed Kennedy in 1963, that's a conspiracy theory. But I have a neighbor who believes that there's a conspiracy ongoing right now to take away our dollars and replace them with the Amero which would be a combination of the American dollar and the, I guess, the dinero. And it will be called the Amero. And even though that hasn't happened yet, he's, he's dreading the day where his dollars are taken from him um, by this, I guess, the trilateral commission, he calls it. They're going to make him use the Amero. Um, the theory appeals to a conspiracy to explain something, something that happened, is happening, or will happen. Um, so again, Kennedy is a, is a really good example of this. If you think somebody other than Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president in 1963, um, then you're probably engaging in conspiracy theory. Um, so how big are these beliefs in the United States? Well, if you think that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy rather than a lone gunman, you're not alone. In fact, that's a majority belief, and it's been a majority belief since 1963. Um, it, about 60% of Americans believe that, and that number is actually down from where it was for most of the last 50 years. It was 80% it was and sometimes even above that. If you think that George W. Bush or the Jews or the Saudis or someone else blew up the Twin Towers on 9-11, um, you, you know, about 3 in 10 Americans believe that, and that number is actually coming up over time rather than going down. And part of the reason for that is because Donald Trump has now made it acceptable for Republicans to believe in that conspiracy theory too, because he keeps hyping it. Whereas it used to be around 20%, mostly just Democrats, but now Republicans think it's okay to accuse the Bushes of engaging in wide-ranging conspiracy theories. If you think Barack Obama faked his birth certificate to illegally usurp the presidency, that's a one in five belief in the US. If you think that Zika is some sort of plot to poison us or make us buy um, dangerous uh, pharmaceuticals, then again, a one in five belief. Um, if you don't brush your teeth with fluoride toothpaste, or if you want the city to get rid of fluoridation from the water, um, don't come within 10 feet of me because you probably have bad <coughs> breath um, and bad dental, um, but you're one in 10. Um, and this belief is actually quite even though it's 1 in 10, it's actually quite a powerful belief where you have many major cities in the US, Canada, and other countries getting fluoride out of the water, um, much to the shame of dentists and much to the chagrin of, of teeth that are rotting out. Um, in Florida, so I figured I'd give you some US beliefs, and since most of you probably live in Florida, some, some Florida beliefs. Um, about a quarter of Floridians think that Castro, was, that Castro killed Kennedy. Um, not just uh, the CIA, but Castro did it. And if when we poll on Castro in Florida, we've got most people here hate him, so it just sort of makes sense. I think they'll blame him for anything. 20% um, of Floridians believe the shootings at the Pulse nightclub and Parkland High School were false flags perpetrated by the government to take away our guns. Um, and 15% believe that the government controls major weather events like hurricanes and tornadoes. I didn't even think this was a, was a thing until I was buying my supplies for Hurricane Irma and I was standing in line at Target to buy my water and batteries and the cashier turned to me and said, I know Trump is doing this. And I said, doing what? She said, he sent the hurricane here to get us. And I said, that can't, I, I said, you really believe that? And she said, yep, I believe it. And I thought maybe, you know, it's just cashiers at Target that believe this or maybe it's some stress thing going on because of the hurricane. So I turned to the lady behind me and I said, you know, do you believe that Trump is sending the hurricane to get us? And she said, I do. And I said, what do you do for a living? And she said, I'm a school teacher. That's where the laughing usually stops. 
Um, why do these beliefs matter? They, can, they are a little bit kooky and zany, um, some of them, but um, beliefs lead to action. And if people make decisions based on these beliefs and majorities vote based on these, um, these dubious ideas, then we're all stuck with the consequences. And that's where they can become very dangerous. Um, in our polarized country right now, each of these beliefs, and I'll just list them, garner about 20 to 25 percent in, in opinion polls. Um, so one question was, do you think that Barack Obama is the Antichrist? 20 percent. Do you think that Hillary Clinton is a demon from hell? Around 25 percent. And this was uh, preceded by a belief going around by Alex Jones uh, saying that she smelled like sulfur because she had just come from hell. Um, and about 20% believe that Trump is actually scarier um, than the devil himself. So um, when we ask people about what conspiracy theories they believe in, um, one, one question we start with is, here's a list of groups. Check all the groups you think are conspiring against us right now. And what we find is that Democrats and Republicans equally point fingers at the other side. So Republicans are concerned about liberals and communists conspiring against us, and uh, Democrats are concerned about conservatives and corporations conspiring against us. So it's not just that we're divided, it's that we think the other side and the other side's coalition are, are actively out to get us right now. And in our rhetoric, we wound up in a place where conspiracy theories are being used to counter conspiracy theories, and we're sort of in a in a hurricane of conspiracy theories right now. So to give you one example, um, during the election, one conspiracy theory that Donald Trump pushed was that Hillary Clinton was really sick and she was on the verge of death, but she was hiding it until after the election. She was too sick to be president. Um, so this actually caused her to change her behavior. So when she actually did get sick, which you would expect from a presidential candidate when you're traveling around and shaking a million hands, um, um, she had to hide it. So at the 9-11 memorial, she wound up, she had the flu, and she wound up getting a little bit faint as they, as they took her away um, from the morning sun. And of course, Trump capitalized on this and said, see, I told you, I, I, I told you so, um, when she came out the next day. The conspiracy theory was, that's not her, that's a doppelganger. She's already dead. Other conspiracy theorists said, that's not her. We could tell by the sight of the pantsuit. So she, she, to counter these ideas, she had to go on to late night talk shows. And one thing she did to show how strong and virile she was was to open a pickle jar. So she opens the pickle jar on the Jimmy Kimmel show, the conspiracy theory the next day. The pickle jar was already opened. It's all a scam to trick you. So we can't seem to get away from the conspiracy theories right now. Um, so just to compare U.S. and German conspiracy beliefs, so when we ask a question in both countries, do you think that the government is hiding the true number of immigrants, you get similar numbers, but the U.S. about 55% believe that's true. It's 40% in Germany. Um, believing that climate change is a hoax, um, that's a much higher belief in the U.S. than Germany. It's about 30% in the U.S. Um, Europeans tend to believe in climate change more than Americans do. Um, when asked if AIDS is a hoax perpetrated by the government to kill its own citizens, very few Germans believe it, but almost twice as many Americans do. And do you think aliens have landed here and are being covered up by the government? You get 20% of Americans, um, but far fewer Germans. There's something about the U.S. that leads us to believe in aliens, and it could be what happened in Roswell um, 80 years ago when they landed here. Um, but we're not the country that believes in it most, and the country that most believes in aliens is actually Argentina, and they edge us out by about five or six percent. And I sat down with some Argentinian people and I said, why do you think so many Argentinians believe in alien cover-ups? And I thought I was going to get this nice sociological answer, and the answer was, because the Pope runs an Area 51 down in northern Argentina, we've seen them in the sky. So I'm like, oh, I guess that explains the poll numbers then. Um, and Germans' views on democracy and other conspiracy-ish stuff. So about half of Germans believe they live in a very democratic area or a very democratic country. 
22% of Germans think that um, the system is broken. 50% of Germans believe that a few people really run things even though it's supposedly a democracy. And about 15% of Germans believe that a secret group like the Illuminati or something like that really control all world affairs and events. And those are my books that you can buy on Amazon from your phone right now. <laughs> Thank you. Marcus Thiel from FIU. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Luis, for organizing the series of roundtables. And so really, it was a true pleasure to collaborate with you and that you took the charge and you organized everything so wonderfully, perfectly German. Um, that was really fantastic. But anyway, um, in the next few minutes, I want to get uh, yeah, tone it down a notch or two, um, because we're here talking about the European Parliament. And it's a super exciting topic, as you can <laughs> imagine. So I will tell you a little bit about the European Parliament, because most Europeans don't know about it either. Um, and then sort of a little bit, what kind of polarization may there be going on? And why is this important? Because the European Parliament elections will be held at the end of this May. They're only being held every five years. And um, there has been a lot of, relatively, a lot of coverage, more than usual, about the potential rise of the, and the unifying of the far right, European far right, to basically be represented in the EU's, the European Union's, European Parliament, to work against the European Union. So let's see how much of this is true. Um, yeah, like I said, a little bit of a background. Uh, so since 1979, EU member state citizens directly elect their representatives to the European Parliament. Before, it was basically representatives from the national parliaments that came together to give some guidance in the European Union. The next elections are going to be um, held over the period of three days from May 23rd to May 26th in um, 2019. Um, and again, there's right now a lot of this kind of emerging coverage on the elections and what may happen then. The European Parliament has 700, currently 751 members that are elected for five years across the European states. They are elected on national party lists. Uh, that means on a national basis and mostly um, for the policy nerds here amongst you on, according to proportional representation, most of them. The European Parliament is important, but many, even many Europeans don't realize how important it is. Um, it is the main co-legislative chamber, that means the parliamentarians that are elected by European citizens, so that makes it the only elected body in the European Union, and they co-legislate new laws um, together with the representatives of the member states the Council of Ministers, but let's not talk about this. Um, so they are responsible also and they direct and give provide input in the majority of newly created European Union laws. They are also co-responsible for the drawing, not for the drawing up, but for the passing of the EU's budget. And as you can imagine, that's also quite important. Right? There's sort of distribution fights amongst the 27 slash 28 member states, depending on Brexit. And maybe we can touch about this touch on this in a second. And they also, um, for the couple past years now, since the Treaty of Lisbon in 2009, they're responsible for <coughs> approving international agreements, such as, for example, that originally planned uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, TTIP, TTIP, Trans Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership between the European Union and the US. So that the SWIFT agreement, the data exchange agreement, right? All of these, the European Parliament has an improve, important approval role in that. Now, the seating arrangement in the chamber, or I should have probably written in the chambers because they have two, but let's not get into that, um, there is defined by party allegiance and not by nationality. So I'm just going to jump quickly ahead. So this is, these are basically the party, the seating arrangements. And you can see here, all the, on the very left, on the reddish one, right, for example, the big block, all the social democrats, the socialists and social democrats, the 142 that you see here, they sit together from 28 different member states, right? And on the other hand, the major center-right block from the European People's Party, or EPP, all those folks from 28, well, yeah, kind of, 28 member states sit here together because they're united by their center-left or center-right ideology. But I'll get back to that. Don't, don't worry. Um, because the main cleavage is really left-right politics. And the European Parliament is supposed to help construct 
new and more European laws in general and policies. So, as I just pointed out, the largest two political groups are the center-right or the right-leaning European People's Party, which holds currently 217 seats, followed by the left-leaning Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, or Socialists and Social Democrats, if you want to call them that, with 186 seats. Um, together, for the past couple years, or even legislative periods, they have kind of had like a, what we could call, if you're familiar with the German concept of the Grand Coalition, right? They had sort of a Grand Coalition in which they dominated pretty much the politics that were going on in the chamber. But so one of the threats is that now with the strong emergence, potential strong emergence of the far right that may unite across Europe, that their um, dominance is not continuing anymore. So European citizens often don't realize the importance of the European Parliament, right? It is because it's a second order elections, they are busy enough with the national political, politic, politicking. And so what happens in Brussels is often seen as sort of, you know, a whole different affair. So only about 40% of Europeans on average have taken part in the past couple election cycles. In 2014, it was around 40 and before I think it was 42%. It's much less for youth. For, for millennials and the, the youth in general, it's only about 20 to 25 percent of folks that went voting in 2014 for the European Parliament. Okay, now a little bit about sort of the, the seating arrangements. And you can see here two kind of circles. The, the front, the, the highlighted one, which with 700 of, 705 seats, right? That's the projected seats um, now in May. And in the back, you have the same kind of circle with the original 751 seats. Now, the difference, why do we have 705 seats? Because until yesterday, pretty much, uh, when the European Union had their, their Brexit emergency summit, it was expected that the United Kingdom will not participate in the European elections at the end of May, right? And that would have meant that if the UK uh, is being removed, all of their parliamentarians are being removed as well. So we had a fewer number of seats, 705. And that creates some interesting shifts. But now, as of today, again, it can change tomorrow, as of today, it looks like that Britain will actually participate. So this already is outdated. When I sent it to you last, I don't know, two days ago, three days ago, this already is outdated, right? Uh, we probably will have 751 seats. But um, let's look at what kind of party groups are there represented and how strong are they? And um, the neat thing is if you look at the back circle, basically the current circle, as opposed to the one that is projected for the elections in May, here in the front, you see that um, there's on the very left, there's the European United Left or the Nordic Green Left. These are the sort of, you know, hardline socialist and communist parties across Europe. Um, they are right now, they have 52 seats and they're projected to keep about the same with 49 seats. Um, this is from the polls of polls, I should have sourced that. But then. Um, the major bloc of social, socialists and social democrats right now have 80, 186 seats and you can see they will, they're projected to lose quite a significant number, right? Down to 142. Again, the two major parties will lose their um, uh, majority because of polarization. The Greens, um, they make up right now 52, they're projected to retain 51 seats. ALDE, the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats, basically the sort of centrist liberals across Europe, um, they have right now 68, projected to keep around 72. In fact, likely they're going to be gaining more. Why is that the case? I'll tell you in a second. The major center-right party, right now 217 seats, the European People's Party, um, where the German Christian Democrats, are, of course, are also in there. Um, they are supposed to lose seats down to 188. <coughs> Then we have here the European Conservative and Reformist groups, the more conservative, right-leaning um, conservatives across Europe. For example, the British Conservatives are in there, Theresa May's Conservatives. Um, right now they have 76, and that's why you can also see the drop, because there are big losses projected for the Conservative Party in, if they take part, in fact, in May. And then we get into the Eurosceptic camp the rather polarizing camp that had such illustrious members such as um, Mussolini's granddaughter, Marine Le Pen, the founder of the French National Front, Nigel Farage, the guy who was responsible, co-responsible for the Brexit mess, right? And so here we have the European Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy group that has right now uh, 41 
supposed to get down to 30. Again, a result technically of Brexit was projected that all the UKIP members would pull out there, or would be lost. And the European Europe of Nations and Freedom that right now has 37 members and that's projected to grow quite significantly. Because if you follow the European um, far-right emergence a little bit over the past couple of years, uh, Marine Le Pen in particular has built up that party group, right? And is projected to be quite a significant force in the upcoming European elections. And these are just non-affiliated members. Okay, so now that we talked about the, we took, we took a look at the general seating arrangement and what may change in terms of the emergence of the far right and um, the losing of control of sort of the mainstream consensus, you can take a look here at the 2014 country, country by country representational changes. And um, this is taken from The Economist from 2014, and you can see here that each country has a certain number of seats parliamentarians that they can send, based largely on population. So Germany can send the most, 96, and in 2014, seven of those were from the AFD, right? Marked here in red. And that means, of course, they were first entrants, so seven new far-right members. And so you, for each country, right, you can check it out. France, uh, 24 of the French 74 members of the European Parliament came from the Marine Le Pen's, or uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen's, Front National, which now had a party name change. Italy already had um, the Lega between the Lega Norte, the northern Italian, uh, former regionalist but now nationalist party, and uh, Cinque Stelle, the five-star party. They sent 22 Eurosceptics. And the United Kingdom unexpectedly, right? Uh, not, not unexpected, actually, 24, and so on and so on. So I thought this was kind of interesting to get the country breakdown. Now, if you also look here at the bottom, you can see that in 2009, we had 56 parliamentarians that were classified as, classified as far right, right, or extreme right, whatever you want to call it. 2014, so that total number added up to 108, right? So now the big question is, of course, what's it going to be in the future? in the next one. But before I'm going to take a look at that, here just a very quick overview. I'm not going to go over all this, this, but this is sort of the, according to the European Council on Foreign Relations, the anti-European manifesto. And this is interesting. If you look at some of these points, what they want to do if they were to garner strength now after the elections, right? Both, by the way, the far left that you saw on this side, which is anti-EU because the European Union is too neoliberal for them, and on the, other on the other hand, the far right, which of course is too nationalistic to like European polity policies. By the way, if you think about it, both of them have been approached and are currently still wooed by uh, Vladimir Putin, which very nicely plays to the leftist, right, post-communist socialist arguments as well as to the rightist uh, nationalist um, um, ambitions. Yeah, so you have here a couple of these. Particular number four is important, promoting the EU's disintegration from within, so being sort of a veto player and a destroyer, blocking the EU's external trade agenda, blocking further NATO uh, integration, um, curbing climate change policies, and so on and so on. Wonderful list, sort of to-do list. Now, with regards to the project projected seat changes in 2019, um, these are, again, the party groups and so these are the, another, that's another projection here, but what I thought was interesting because the highlighting of what will happen here with the seat changes. So you can see here for, from the very left on top, the green united, the united greens, down to the bolded to far right blocks here. And there are basically two because Nigel Farage and Marine Le Pen, they have both big egos. And so they, 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 they compete for these far right votes. And they still kind of do, particularly if Nigel Farage now is allowed to run again. But anyway, what's interesting here is you can see um, the parties that will gain and the number of seats that are projected to gain and in green, yeah, and then in red, the ones that will lose. And of course, you can see the mainstream parties, again, lose heavily, are projected to lose heavily. And um, particularly here, the Marine Le Pen's bloc, together with the Lega Nord in Italy, based on Italy's populist drive over the past couple of years, is supposed to expect it to win quite significantly. Now, I don't have time to go over this, nor can you really see this, but I thought for some of you, it may be just interesting to see how diverse the number of different far-right parties is that is trying to compete. Um, and there are many new entrants. And the third line basically tells you from 2018 to 2019 the projected increase. And so you can see here, the most increases come from Italy, 
from the Northern League, from six currently to 29 that are projected, and from the Five Star Movement from 14 to 24, and then the French from 15 to 22. And the alternative for Germany has an increase of, a projected increase here from seven seats to 13 seats. So not all that much. Now, this projection already tells you that supposedly there may be 132 seats. So remember, 56 seats of far riders in 2009, 105 going to 130 to 32, or maybe even higher, but we don't know that. And to conclude, if you can have one more minute, please, uh, I'll try to keep it. The winners, of course, likely, probably, but not certainly, as it's made out in the media, maybe the far right. If the far right can unite to the extent um, that they, they would like to because they have this con common enemy, which is, which is the European Union and which are migrants more generally, right? Which we had an issue with. Some countries, however, France, Italy, will contribute more to the emergence of the far right than others such as Germany. The Greens and smaller parties then, of course, are needed to exclude the Eurosceptics, the, the far right. And um, because they're then the one that can help the big remaining parties gain a majority in parliament. So those are the winners. The losers are, of course, the two dominant parties, the EPP and the Social Democrats. They are set to lose, for the first time, the joint control majority of the parliament. Now, why may it not be as bad as it's sometimes made out to be in the, in the media? There are institutional factors that count. The EU truly lacks, the EU level, truly lacks transnational EU-wide parties, because they're national party elections, national party lists, and also contestation in Brussels. There was something called the Spitzenkandidat process, which I don't have time to go into it, but it didn't really lead to motivate voters across Europe. So in the European Parliament elections, there's really less um, political contestation, electoral pressure than on the national levels that we see in France, in Italy, in Spain now with the emergence of Fox, in Germany with the IFD. Parties also need to have, because it's PR elections, generally between 4 and 5% nationwide to even enter the European Parliament. Right? And so some of these more fringe parties, they may not even get in because they cannot get the votes. And again, the far right is way too nationalistic to build a cohesive group. We've seen this. The AFD, the German AFD, they're, they're now trying to collaborate with uh, the Lega Nord from Salvini, who just had a conference to unite the European far right movements. But just a year or two years ago, the leadership of the AFD called the Italian budget crazy or something like that. Right? So you can see here, there are really huge also ideological differences not only based on nationality, but ideological differences that make it diff difficult for them to unite. Marine Le Pen has a f major fraud examination hanging over her cloud, and so on and so on. And mainstream parties, of course, keep them from receiving funds and seats on parliamentary committees. And that's where the real power lies. So it, overall, to take away more parties on the left, we see the Spanish Podemos, the Greek uh, uh, Varoufakis uh, democracy movement, they're running more uh, centrist parties, upstart parties, populist ones are running, such as Emmanuel Macron in France, the, uh, Republic, um, the, the Republic movement, as well as on the right, there's a whole identity movement. Um, so the question is, could they work together against the EU or not, particularly as it regards Russia, where they may have common, a common cause, the left and the right. And, of course, the last question is if the anti-EU position of many extreme parties and movements which is often more easily vocalized as protest voice, voices, is, is enough to mobilize voters to actually vote against the European Union, which is such a, has become such a, still a basic framework for any politics in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. And our last speaker tonight is Roger Stocker from Magdeburg. Yeah, Luis, uh, thanks for introducing me and thanks that you all be here. I think this evening we are wunderbar together and from Germany, guten Abend. Uh, let me start with a picture. What do you see on my first pick? Um, you see at first that most of German chancellors were men, Till Merkel. And you see that Angela Merkel now comes in the Hall of Fame of German chancellors. And that's the beginning of my uh, few minutes of, of an issue. I will talk about German 
politics and I think for many people is not as wonderful as it could be. This picture uh, will show that the end of the era of Angela Merkel is coming and we have a new era of German politics. Uh, Louise has said that German politics, the German party system was over decades a very stable one. You see all of the German chancellors from state building 1994 was one of the big parties, the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats. And Germany has, after state building, a lot of crisis, um, has uh, been the center of the Cold War, has a reunification and a lot of European crisis, debt crisis, refugee crisis. But it was, uh, till today, a very stable political and party system. But now it changed. We have seen um, these results of German federal elections some minutes ago to 2002, I have a shot to 2017. And we see that the major parties on the black line and on the red line have a lot of percent in the 1970s till mid 80s. And till mid 80s, the results go down. And today, on 2017, last year, the Social Democrats and Christian Democrats has 53%. Um, you may know you need 50 person to build a government, uh, a normal government, not a minority government in Germany. And this is a very thin majority. And maybe in next election, it's mathematically not possible to build a majority with the two former very big parties. And it's hard to predict if it's happened, but um, I think there's a chance that it's happened that there's no majority. What's easier to predict is that this person won't be the chancellor after the next federal election. The next election is uh, regularly in 2021, maybe earlier, nobody knows, um, but Angela Merkel's time is over. Um, the reason why Angela Merkel don't be chancellor anymore is this. She was a person who was, for a head of government, very popular in the German democracy. About 70% said in 2013, yeah, we like Angela Merkel and her policy. And in 2016, not 50%. Um, that's the reason why her party said, OK, we need a change. And Merkel said, OK, I don't want for chairwoman again. And it's actually uh, interesting if you see the electoral campaign for the European Parliament. There's nothing which had, which, which had to deal with Angela Merkel. Before, the whole Christian Union party was built around her, was totally focused on Merkel. She was a face of a party in every campaign, everywhere with Merkel. Today, on the European campaign, um, you think she's already retired. I think it's hard for a person who was a face of, of, of her party uh, to be unseen from one day to another. Um, who benefits? This party. We've told the alternative for Germany. And at first, in 2013, when the party was founded, I think it won't be a problem if such a party is, becomes a political player. Because um, the party was founded from economic professors who was against the, the Euro rescue policy of Angela Merkel. This was uh, neoliberal people who said, OK, we make a movement and then an own party. But times change. The party changed, the staff changed, and the policy changed. Now national conservative far right people um, dominate this party. They push the, the AFD to the far right. And today, it is very, in my opinion, it's very special that such a party um, get power and, re and such good results in Germany. Um, you all know the dark sides of the German history and the German society um, has, a, has a strained relationship to national attitudes, to far-right opinions, and that was for decades a big problem for right-wing parties. And the AFD is the first party who can deal with this problem. It's the first party who skipped the 5% hurdle. It's the first party who entered the national parliament. 
um, after some successes on state level and the success on the European election in 2014, uh, this is the result of 2017, Louise already showed it, and 12.6% is from a German view a result with this, it's, it's not good with such a far-right party and it's unique. Um, what are the reasons for this change and for the rise of the AFD? Let me um, show you three reasons. There are a lot of more, but in 10 minutes I can only focus on a few issues. You see on this picture two people that are miners. Miners in the Ruhr area, it's a very industrial area in Germany. And these miners are classical voters of the Social Democratic Party, decades before. Uh, in the 60s, 70s, till the 80s, if you are uh, working as a miner and it's election day, you know I have to vote for Social Democrats. Similar to it, there are people who are religious people. They people who go Sunday to church, they vote for Christian Democrats decades ago. The problem is that these groups of people, these social groups, are shrunk. In the 1970s, about the half of the working people were traditional classical workers with physical hard jobs, like these miners. Today, only 25%. In the 1950s, 90% of all people in Germany were part of one of the big churches, Catholic people, Protestant people. Today, about 50%. So the major parties have a problem that their classical social groups become um, uh, lower, uh, they, they shrunk, these groups. And the second problem is that these groups, these social groups, um, become more individual. The individualization that is, I think is America the same um, has an effect of the voting behavior. The voting behavior becomes more individual too. Today, a minor doesn't uh, vote for, for the social democrats. He votes for the Christian democrats, for the liberals, or maybe for the AFD. Um, that's the first problem for the major parties, and that's a chance for new parties like the AFD to get uh, some voters there. Uh, second problem is that the major parties for years and after Merkel have no charismatic leaders. I don't know if Angela Merkel is a charismatic leader, but there were times a lot of people in Germany liked her. She's, uh, a lot of people said she's a good chancellor. Merkel isn't the type of politician um, who inspires the people. But Merkel was a pragmatic, uh, technocratic politician, and that works for years in Germany. But now a lot of people say, ah, oh, we would like another person, another type of politician. A lot of people in her own party, too. And the problem is, there's no one. That's the successor of Angela Merkel, is Annegret Kram karrenbauer She's technocratic, too, till today, maybe. In future she will inspire the people and become a new Obama or Macron, I don't know, but uh, by now she isn't it. And by the way, I've thought it on the class, uh, in front of the class from Louise, um, I think for, for, for news reporters her name is difficult to pronounce, Annegret kram karrenbauer and for Germans too, and so they call her AKK, you see it <laughs> <laughs> on the poster. And I don't think that's the person the German society dreams of. Um, the Social Democrats have the same problem. There were a, a small uh, window of time. There were a person, the former president of the European Parliament and candidate who runs for cancellorship in 2017, Martin Schulz, who was a person who everybody thinks, yeah, he's inspiring. He's our, no chance. He's our chancellor. Um, he get his own hype. For a few weeks, the Social Democrats get results uh, as high as uh, Christian Democrats, but this hype was over. Um, Martin Schulz today has no role in the political system in Germany. And uh, after him, there came Andrea Nahles. And she's a person, 
she is unpopular. I, I think I have more to say about this person. She's unpopular, you know, she, she, she knows it. And I think that she knows that she um, don't need to run for chancellorship. And she said that her deputy, the German vice chancellor and former major of Hamburg, Olaf Scholz, will run for chancellorship. But Scholz is a technocrat, technocratic political too. Um, so there is nobody who is the German Obama or Macron. Um, there's one person I noticed uh, last month, last years, that's um, the chairman of the Green Party, Robert Habeck. And some observers say he could be our new chancellor. And if observers, if political observers say, or when political observers say, there's a person who is our new chancellor, could be our new chancellor, and he's not a chairman or a member of a majority parties, you know that these parties had better days. The third reason why the big parties had better days are the cleavage structure of Germany. For decades, the most significant cleavage was the conflict between work and capital. The major parties were clearly classified. The Social Democrats make policy for the workers, and the Christian Union make policy not against the workers, but more for uh, employers and for the capital. And there were big discussions about the design of our welfare state and how long people have to work, what did they earn. And you can make a lot of politics with it uh, cleavage. But today, the cleavage structure has changed. Now we have, you have told it, Jonathan, uh, cultural cleavage in Germany too. Uh, conflict between materialist and post-materialist. You, I think a lot of things, I don't have read your book yet, but I think I don't, uh, a lot of things fixed people and fluid people um, in the US are, there are some groups in Germany too. There are a lot of parallels. You see the change of our cleavage structure on this chart. I translate. The red line means um, the most signif significant problem for German society. And until 2013, it was unemployment. Red line. After 2013, is a blue line. Migration. Um, most of you know Germany has, in the last years, a lot of migration. About a million people came fleeing from war, from Syria, from Afghanistan, Iraq, or fleeing from poverty. And Germany has, or the established German parties, um, has an uh, uh, and welcome culture, built and welcome culture. and. Angela Merkel was the face of this welcome culture. Her famous soundbite uh, was, we schaffen das. It's in, in English, we can manage this crisis. And she made selfies with some refugees. And so Germany become popular for a lot of people who come in this country. But um, not everyone likes this policy of Merkel. Um, there are some Germans who say, OK, um, that's not our way of life. Okay. And the AFD sharply criticized Merkel's policy. It's, it's, it's not only Merkel's policy. It's the policy of Angela Merkel, big parts of the Christian Democrats, of the Social Democrats, the Greens, the Liberals, and the left. Um, but the main poll against this policy <coughs> was the AFD. And you see how strongly connect the refugee policy of Angela Merkel and the results of the AFD, blue line, um, how strong it correlates. You see, in September 2015, when, the, when a lot of people came to Germany, the AFD starts with 4% and then gets up to 12 and on and on. And today, this is about 15% in polls. Um, what will happen after the era of Angela Merkel? Um, beside the AFD, there's another um, dimension, I think, that are more the fluid people. Um, on the cultural conflict. This on the right side, I don't know if you know this person. It's Greta Thunberg uh, from Sweden. And she is uh, the face of an environmental movement in Europe. And a lot of German people 
are in that movement. We have, in, in my town, we have every Friday, um, Fridays for Future, young students skip school and demonstrate against the climate change and uh, the environmental policy. And that's the counterpart of that, what you see on the left, the classical voters of the AFD. And that will be in the next years maybe the main conflict in Germany. And I think we can talk about this now. It's, it's, it's very parallel to the USA. It's the same conflict, the same, or nearly same cultural conflict we reflect in the USA with one difference. In the USA, we have two parties who are clearly catered, clearly catered in this conflict. In Germany, we have parties who dominate this conflict, but this aren't the major parties, like in the US. It are smaller parties, and so we have a change in our party system in the US, maybe not. Okay, that's it. much. Let's take a couple questions for the audience and then we can go enjoy our snacks. Francisco has the microphone and we ask you to speak in the microphone, not so much so the people here can hear you, but because this is being video recorded and it helps our videographer. So we had a question over here. Hi, thanks. Thanks. It was great. Um, Jonathan, I would like you to very briefly explain uh, well, how you measure the fixed and fluid worldviews, because that's an interesting story and, and you didn't get to that about child-rearing attitudes. I think the audience would find it very interesting. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, we use, in order to determine oops, who's fixed and who's fluid, we ask four questions. And those four questions are about how people think children should be raised. And we've sometimes referred to these four parenting questions as the Rosetta Stone of American politics because they've come to be such a powerful explainer. I'm just gonna show you these very briefly and I'll leave them up here. Um, but people are asked to, they're given pairs of choices and they're asked which of these do you think is more important for children to have? And you can see the, the pairs of choices, independence versus respect for elders, curiosity for, versus good manners and so forth. And these, it turns out, are now extraordinarily predictive of whether people vote Democratic or Republican, as well as their views on an enormous range of issues, from gay rights to immigration to race and so forth and so on. I want to say one very quick thing about that, which is that when people look at these pairs, their usual first instinct is, well, these all look important to me, right? So I have a daughter who's now 21. When she was little, yes, I wanted her to be curious, but when we went out to eat, I did not want her to be a disgusting slob. So yes, of course I wanted her to have good manners. But what's noteworthy about this is when you force people to make a choice and they therefore prioritize, it's in that prioritization that we get, as I said, this very powerful explanation for why people think about the world the way that they do. And I do want to say quickly about Germany, we put the four parenting questions on a German survey and those four parenting questions explain extraordinarily well who voted green and who, vo who voted AFD, with fluids overwhelmingly voting green and fixed overwhelmingly voting AFD. So these, these seem to travel, in other words. Uh, so thank you for the interesting presentations. Uh, I'm a little bit troubled by the autonomy ascribed to cultural uh, factors. Um, so, um, and it's interesting that you just said green rather than social democratic. Workers have always been culturally conservative, uh, rooted, uh, believing in family, uh, believing in community, um, stability, the, the qualities that are associated with progressiveness are the qualities of middle class and um, educated people, not of working class people. The difference is that the Democratic Party here and the Social Democratic Party in Germany once stood for those people and linked provincial, small-minded neighborhood people to larger ideologies and larger causes. And they have been abandoned. The US Democratic Party is today the party of the suburban middle class. It's not the party of working people at all. It's not that 
people's cultural values have changed. It seems to me more to be a matter of what larger class agendas uh, those people have been uh, attached to. So I'm wondering if, if, if there might be um, more of a need for a little bit more materialism underlying uh, the cultural analysis. And if, and if I may, on the conspiracy question, you know, I don't know, this is a continuum. I mean, if Orban puts up signs that says Soros is funding the migration of millions of Muslims to take over Europe, yeah, on the one hand, it's a conspiracy. On the other hand, it is saying something very crudely, but it's saying something about who wants what in the world, and it's not entirely off, just as it's not entirely off to say that a president who uh, has the attitude that this one does toward climate change and shows us what has happened in Puerto Rico, yeah, this guy is going to be, this. these things are going to be responsible in the future for hurricanes that are going to destroy my life. There is, um, there is some, something between inarticulousness and conspiracy that seems to me that you have kind of overly dichotomized. All right, great. Thoughts from our panelists? <laughs> Question first. Um, so the, the, I'll just stick with the survey questions for the first part. And so we didn't say, do you, are you upset with Trump and how he handled Puerto Rico? We said, do you believe the government can control major weather events like hurricanes and tornadoes? It can't. And if you believe that, then, then you're believing things that, that just really aren't true. Um, I'm not even sure of that. I mean, if current climate change denial policy and deregulation continues, then the government will be responsible for increasingly frequent wild hurricanes that are more and more destructive. And it would control them? Let's see. I mean, you, you, I mean, you're really trying to stretch this to a place that it, that, that, that it can't go. And, and, and the first part of your question sort of, um, I mean, I almost find offensive. I mean, George Soros is often accused of all sorts of things, and a lot of this boils down to anti-Semitism. So to say that, oh gosh, we could just dismiss that as you, you know some sort of political commentary. No, I mean, he. A lot of this boils down to very dark and and, and sinister attitudes, both against immigrants and against Jews. I didn't say it was a good policy, but Soros is the representative of a worldview that they want to destroy, right? He's correctly perceived as the enemy of the folks that Orban is building, has built on and wants to advance. Sure, it's not irrational. I mean, I, mean, I mean, that's what conspiracy theory does. As you say, there's an enemy. That enemy is working against us in secret. But the reason why pe people pick some of these enemies that they do, particularly when it comes to a Soros or the Rothschilds or the bankers, it often boils down to things like just bald anti-Semitism. And, and, and it should not be excused or, or, or pasted over. All right. Okay, David, I'm going to cut you off for a minute, please, because we've got a, a big audience and we will have time to have informal conversations offline next. But I think we had a hand up over here, so let's take one or two more audience questions. Thank you. I'll be brief. We have a few young people here in the audience. I have a, a question for the professor from, uh, is it Middleburg? Vectorburg. Vectorburg. Yeah. <laughs> so um, AFD, you showed a graph, 4%, 4 12%, and you say 15%. What is the composition, the demographics? Do you have a significant number of young people that are joining their ideology or they're uh, uh, their joining their um, way of thinking? Um, no. In the past, in Germany, there were right-wing parties which had a lot of good results in younger groups. The AFD not. The, the AFD is a party which is elected by people between, most masculine people, men, vote for the AFD, between 30 and 65. Um, 
not different from the Christian Democrats or liberals. Um, and the, the, at this time, this, there aren't the younger people who vote for them. The Green Party is very popular on young people. And it's the only one at, this, at these days which is uh, significant, more popular on younger people than other parties. Yeah. It's also the party that the most people are joining. So most German part, I mean, the AFD obviously is a new party, so it has a, it's grown in members. But the mainstream German parties are all losing members, and really the only one that's picking up members is the, are the Greens. All right, let's have one more question, and then we'll go enjoy our snacks. Eric Ahona with Japan Business Consulting. Thank you very much for organizing this event. I have to say I'm kind of sad to see that it's the last event in the series. Uh, my question is, um, if I'm up to date, the 2014 EU election voter ratio of voter turnout was slightly below 50%. What is the EU doing to bring voters to actually vote? Yeah, I mean, if you want me to, to, to answer that, um, they're trying, but you know, it's very difficult, right? Because as I wish our German consulate official would be here, he just left the room a couple, Axel uh, Zeissig. Um, you know, there is sometimes a little bit of an issue with between sort of the European level who wants to push the so-called the European agenda also onto the national levels and, and make it important there. Um, but then also the fact that the European elections are run on national topics on national party list, right? So there's this disconnect. Um, with regards to, I mean, I literally, I direct the EU center here, and but that's just a very sort of peripheral experience. We really were approached by the European Union delegation in Washington DC, and they were asking us, can you put an event like this together, right? And so we were trying to, to manage time-wise, and otherwise it just did, what didn't work out for them or for us. Um, so they're trying to, to popularize this abroad, right? Because they're, you know, the Europeans abroad that could maybe influence the elections, may have more interest in sort of preserving Europe with all the coverage that comes out. Uh, domestically, it's really on, I think, on the national level, and it, the national parties have to engage in that. And it really, there's very little the EU, I think, can or maybe even should do, right? If you think about sort of how that, that kind of propaganda may actually backfire as well. Yeah, if you want to add to Okay, I, I only can speak for Germany. Uh, the German government tries with a formal action. Um, the municipal elections are at the same time. So people who vote the new major and so on uh, usually vote for European Union parties too. And that's the first. And the second thing I, think I recognized, uh, I think we have a, um, the people become more politically interested in the last years. I see it on my university, the young students become more interested. Maybe uh, that are the issues that are interesting for young people, migration, environment, protection, and so on. And so um, I think that the turnout in this election would be uh, higher than at last. And I think uh, it, it's, yeah. I think Theresa May has given it a lot of publicity. So one, if you've been following the Brexit negotiations, there's always this question, is Britain going to take part in the elections or not? So if you're following the news, you know that there's this election coming up. Um, so we'll see what happens. Thank you very, very much to our panelists for the interesting presentation. What I would like to call your attention to is we'll very shortly have music from the Frost School of Music. Um, and the other thing is that all of the roundtables in the series, including this one tonight, have been uh, video recorded. And they are now available um, on our YouTube channel and on Vimeo. So there's all on each of your seats, there's a flyer that indicates um, how you can access the roundtables in case you missed some. And this one will be up very soon if you want to share it with somebody else. The other thing that you'll find on your seat is a comment card. Um, because I'm a professor, I like to know what people have learned. 
Um, and I promised the German government who gave us this money that I would demonstrate to them that you all have learned something by coming. Um, so I would greatly appreciate it if you could take the time to fill out the card and let me know um, how you found out about this event and what you've learned. And on your way out on the table outside, there's a little box where you can put your comment card. Um, and we also have their information about local German American organizations, studying in Germany, and other resources about the year in Germany that you're welcome to take along with you. And if you want to know more about Prius versus Pickup, Professor Weiler is speaking tomorrow at 12.30 um, on the University of Miami campus. Um, and you can ask me or America Blowfield over there, um, raise your hand, America, um, for information about how to find him and where he'll be. So thank you very much. Please go enjoy some food or drink and mix and mingle. Meet somebody you don't know and talk to our panelists. <laughs> Thank you.